Hey guys, it's Step Zero MD, and in today's video, we're going to talk about a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. And here we have a quick review slide, courtesy of Amboss Animations, going through some of the common symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis, or AKA AS. So AS is a disease of the spine, AKA spondylitis, itis meaning inflammation, and ankylosing is referring to a fusion or rigidity of the spine. So anything that's ankylosing is fused and rigid. That's the main symptom. But let's go through some of the other things that you can see in this disease. One here is unilateral anterior uveitis. Uh, unilateral means on one side, anterior is the front, and uveitis is inflammation of a tissue called the uvea. This is the middle layer of the eye, contains the iris, choroid, which is the blood supply of the eye, and the ciliary body, which uh, controls lens adjustment in the eye, so it's nearsighted, farsightedness. So you'll get a red eye, you'll get, um, and difficulty with seeing like blurry vision in one eye particularly. Then going down to our next symptom is vascular and cardiac involvement. The blood vessels in the heart can be affected. A common uh, cardiac complication here is aortic regurgitation. So one of the valves called the aortic valve is now incompetent and there's a backflow of blood. You can also have changes in the conduction system of the heart causing heart blocks. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease is also seen. It's commonly associated. This is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis where you have abdominal pain, commonly bloody stools as well. Uh, IgA nephropathy is another rare one, just like cardiac involvement. This is where an antibody called IgA binds an antigen such as a pollen or uh, allergen or bacteria, and then that complex uh, will go down to the kidney and block itself in one of the kidney blood vessels and damage the kidney. Then we have chronic prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate. You'll have cloudy urine here and pain with urination. And Let's go here to the back, which is our major symptom. Pain and restriction of movement. Often the back also gets deformed. There's loss of lumbar lordosis or lower curvature of the back. The most common joint affected is the sacroiliac joint here, joining the sacrum to the ilium of the pelvis. And the pain will be felt here usually the most. Then we can also have arthritis. This is oligoarthritis. One of the joints will be affected like the knee or the elbow and enthesitis, which is inflammation of tendons. Those connect muscles to bone, and the Achilles tendon is one of the common ones for this disease. Let's dive into some symptoms more specifically. So epidemiology of the disease, men are more commonly affected than women with a usually a three to one ratio. The onset is between 15 to 40 years old, and the prevalence in the US is usually 0.5%. So here you can see the countries which have higher prevalences of AS. So it starts out young, uh, usually more common in men. That doesn't mean women can't get it and that doesn't mean older people can't get it. It's just more rare in those populations. All right, joint symptoms. Let's talk about the back. So in the back, you have morning stiffness, which improves with activity. That's very classic. The pain can also be constant during the night, which can affect sleep and there's tenderness over the sacroiliac joint, as you can see in this mannequin right here on the top right. There's limited forward flexion of the spine, so if you try to bend over and touch your toes, it's going to be affected, and later on we'll talk about something called the Schober test, which will demonstrate this. There's inflammation of the joint um, tendons as well, called enthesitis, the Achilles tendon, iliac crest tendons, and tibial tuberosity are commonly also affected here. So here we have a uh, the patellar tendon, which can get inflamed. The iliac tendons in the pelvis can get inflamed, causing more pelvic irritation than you have with the sacroiliac joint. Dactylitis, where the fingers get inflamed. Here we see a classic example in the bottom right. And arthritis outside of the spine can also occur in the hips, shoulders, and knees. So generally, not just the spine can be affected, but also other joints. Watch out for that. Extra articular symptoms is just referring to symptoms outside of the spine and outside of the other joints. The most common one here, like we talked about, is anterior uveitis happening roughly a quarter of all cases. Fatigue, fever, and weight loss are, uh, as well as weakness, are really nonspecific, but they uh, are commonly seen and then restrictive pulmonary disease. Now this is an interesting one because the spine, as you know, is attached to your ribs and the uh, costos 
the, the, the joints that attach the spine to the ribs can be sclerosed and stiffened with this disease. And therefore, when you try to take a deep breath in, your breath is restricted. So this is a restrictive pulmonary disease. IBD, such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, we already discussed, and prostatitis. Now remember the two rare ones are our cardiac diseases with aortic regurgitation and atrioventricular blocks in the conduction system and IgA nephropathy in the kidney is also rare. Diagnosing AS. So the main diagnosis strategy here is through history, physical exam, and a pelvic x-ray. X-rays are really your best friend with this disease because it's used to monitor the disease progression as well. You'll generally get an x-ray every three months to see how uh, badly the joints are affected. And we'll run through some x-rays in the near future to talk about how they look like. Remember that x-rays, you'll only really see changes in later stages of the disease, so you might not catch it early on. If these are, tests are not really diagnostic, we'll move on to testing something called HLA-B27, which is a blood test for a specific antigen in the blood, which is associated with this disease. And if that's still non-conclusive, a pelvic MRI is the last resort to see the inflammation commonly in the sacroiliac joint. Clinical tests. So we already talked about the Schober test, which is when you mark a point on the back, usually it's the dimples of the lower back, and then you measure 10 centimeters above that point. When the patient touches their toes, the distance between those two points should increase by more than four centimeters, so 14 centimeters or more. And if that doesn't happen, it's pathological for a restricted spinal motion. Now, chest expansion should also be measured and pathological differences is less than two centimeters in the circumference of the chest, the difference between inhalation and exhalation. And here we have two other special tests of the hip. Remember, sacroiliac joint is commonly affected. This is Menel's sign, which is tenderness on palpation of the sacroiliac joint and anterior displacement. So that's what this person's doing right here in the pink shorts. And we have the Faber test, which is a acronym for flexion, abduction, external rotation of the hip shown right here in the bottom right for your reference. Lab findings, so blood tests and things like that. So there will be an increase of CRP and ESR. Those are inflammatory markers seen in this disease. Autoantibodies are not seen. So if you're looking for rheumatoid arthritis factor or antinuclear antibodies and things such as lupus, you won't see them in AS. HLA-B27 is positive in most cases. But remember, just because you are HLA-B27 positive doesn't mean you are going to get the disease. So many HLA-B27 positive people don't get AS. X-rays are the greatest thing for this disease because it helps to monitor progression and also in the diagnosis. You'll see very common things like syndesmophytes. These are bony connections between the spine and the difference between a syndesmophyte and an osteophyte. Osteophytes stick out from the bone, but don't connect two bones together, while syndesmophyte acts as kind of bridges, and you'll see something called a bamboo spine, which I'll show you in just a bit. MRIs are also very classically done. They're more sensitive than CT scans for diagnosing soft tissue inflammation, so they're great in diagnosing AS. The problem is they're not that easy to come by, so they're usually done later on down the line or um, if possible. All right, let's talk about the degenerative changes in the spine. There's degeneration and there's inflammation, and those are different things. So here we see an osteophyte in the top right. That's our bony prominence sticking out. This happens because of irritation of the bone. Um, we can have a things affecting the vertebra where the structures are changed. They can be concave, they can be wedged. Uh, here we have a vertebra plana, which is a very wedged in vertebral disc. And now we have a uh, narrower joint spaces, sclerosis in the joint spaces. So that's inflammation and damage of the joint. And inflammation here can be destructive to not only the vertebra, but these intervertebral discs. Sometimes they can pouch out and cause inflammation. And the ligaments, the anterior and posterior spinal ligaments which surround the spine can also be sclerosed and damaged, which further limits mobility. Here we have an X-ray of the neck and if we look at it, it's a lateral x-ray of the cervical spine. And you'll see here, down here, C5 and C6 
are affected. So C5 is dislocated and there's ossification of the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. Now, if it's a little bit hard to see, I'll just point it out here in the green highlights. So just watch out for the anterior posterior ligament ossification in green and the anterior dislocation of C5. Next, we have here the lumbar spine. So here's an x-ray of our lumbar spine lateral view. Um, you'll see the syndesmophytes here, the darker bony prominence is connecting the spine. Uh, and I highlighted them here more uh, clearly in green. There's marginal syndesmophytes causing ossification. And there's also sclerosis and uh, of the vertebral bodies. So you'll see that the vertebral bodies are a little bit indented here in the green sections which are indicative of sclerosis. And sh there's things called shiny corners, or also known as Romanus lesions, which affect the vertebral bodies as well. So if you're looking for AS, really look at the edges of the vertebral bodies because that'll be your main indicator. You'll see the syndesmophytes and you'll see the shiny corners. Lower lumbar is also fused. You'll see in the lower lumbar L5, um, L4, L5, they have this fusion here with bone. So that's very classic of a stenosis spine and AS. Now we have the pelvis. This is very important. This is our diagnostic x-ray. You'll see in the AP view of the pelvis here, uh, there's outlined the inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. You also see arthritis in the hip joints, which are labeled here in green. So sacroiliac joints are main identifier. You'll see commonly sclerosis here, which is the white. And then uh, here you'll also see that there's extensive narrowing of the joint space as well, which is outlined in this dotted green pattern. Our MRI here is also very indicative because it shows soft tissue inflammation. And you see multiple hyper intense lesions, uh, which are classic for spondylitis. Uh, here you'll see them in white. This is a T2 weighted MRI, which means it shows liquid and soft tissues as brighter. So just remember that. And the L5 also shows some compression fracture here. So it's outlined here in red for you. And all of the inflammation and syndesmophytes are seen in green. So they're pointed out here by the green arrows. Differential diagnosis for this disease, uh, there's uh, really four main ones. Fibromyalgia, which is a hypersensitivity to pain. This is without having done an x-ray to see any changes. Disc prolapse, which is when the spine disc kind of pushes out because of arthritis or because of injury. Osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the spine. And DISH, which is diffuse idiopathic skeletal fibros hyperostosis, which is um, the bone gets hyper ossified in the spine. This is classically associated with diabetic patients. There's no HLA B27, but you will see calcification and ossification of ligaments similar to AS. So this is a very good differential diagnosis, especially in a diabetic patient. Complications of AS, you can have complete fusion of the spine, which limits mobility, increased risk of osteoporosis. Again, when you have the spine constantly being inflamed, it gets degraded and has to get rebuilt and it doesn't get rebuilt fast enough so you can get fractures. You have restriction of the chest expansion, which reduces breathing and causes difficulty. Often there's apical lung fibrosis as well. When your lungs aren't able to expand and contract very well, there's commonly fibrosis from recurrent infections or inflammation. And uh, one of the good things about this is that uh, there's no real increase in mortality or employment disability with proper treatment. So let's talk about treatment options. Usually physical therapy is very important. Getting out, moving around will help with joint symptoms. Remember, they will reduce over, to, over the course of the day with movement. The first choice here is an NSAID or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, commonly indomethacin is prescribed. Um, additional options if it's not well controlled with an NSAID is TNF alpha inhibitors, such as etanercept and adalimumab. These are inflammatory controlling drugs. And remember something to watch out for with TNF alpha inhibitors is to get a TB test beforehand because it can uh, reactivate latent TB in some patients who have TB. In cases of peripheral arthritis, you can use something called a DMARD or disease modifying agent, such as sulfasalazine, um, which is a cousin of 
aspirin or 5-ASA. And in severe cases, you can have uh, steroid joint injections. These are steroids or glucocorticoids here, and they can be injected directly into the joint to prevent further inflammation. If drugs or therapies can't control the inflammation, then you can get surgeries to improve quality of life. If the spine is too deformed, uh, surgeries can help fix that. If there's neurologic deficits, if the nerve is being compressed, the surgery can also help alleviate that as well. And that's an osteotomy, joint replacement, or spinal fusion to stabilize the spine. So I hope you've enjoyed our little talk today on AS, and I hope you've learned a little bit. And I'll see you guys in the next video.